Good afternoon. Once again, we have this privilege, this opportunity to pause from our normal activities to reflect on the Word of God, that which is unchanging and that which makes our lives meaningful, purposeful, because we've had a chance by accepting Christ to be connected to that which is eternal, eternal Godhead and his eternal plan for us. Let us start today with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we come once again in the name of Jesus the Christ, your son, acknowledging that we have not been precisely what we should be, for as we look back, we see we have stepped in the wrong directions, thought the wrong things, said things that were not graceful and honoring. And we ask that you would forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then, Father, we pray that you would bring our hearts, our minds, the entirety of our being into alignment with you and your will. <coughs> Excuse me. So we, in turn, can pause <coughs> to reflect on your word, hear what you have said, understand what it means, and then apply it to our lives. Thank you, Father. Bless us and keep us. Let all we do bring glory and honor to thee. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> the Lord created man uniquely. Uh, man was created by God to reflect the Lord's image. In fact, the Lord breathed life into man after forming him from the dust of the ground and he became a living soul. <clears throat> Thus, man was created to connect with and have intimate relationship with God. The Bible reveals that man fell in the Garden of Eden and sinned by disobeying God. <clears throat> Accordingly, the intimacy that was intended between God and man was broken. Thankfully, God has implemented a plan through the Lord Jesus Christ to reconcile mankind back to him. In the prior two sessions covering Ephesians 1, Paul has discussed the wonderful blessings the Lord, the Lord has bestowed on those who accepted Christ's reconciling work. One highlight of these blessings was receiving the resurrection power of the Lord Jesus Christ in the life of those who believe. In today's lesson, Paul shared how sinners deserving of nothing become examples of the beauty of God's amazing transforming grace. The lesson covers Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1 through 10 and is entitled, We Are God's Handiwork. Please join me in reading these passages. We will review after we've read the passage, the gloomy past, the great provision, and the glorious position. First of all, let us pay close attention to the word of God and what it says to us. Ephesians chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. And you he made alive who were dead in trespass trespasses and sins, in which... You once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. But God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace have you been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest, any man sh lest anyone should boast. 
For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Amen to the reading of God's word. These are some very profound words that Paul shares here that follow on to what he had established over in chapter 1. Remember you, chapter 1, he indicated that we are blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And he goes on to assure us the great heritage that we have in Christ. And then that we are we are benefit from this resurrection power reflective of what happened to the Lord Jesus Christ when he got up from the grave. It indwells us and then it capped off with the fact that we have the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, living in us to guarantee that we are God's children who've accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we move into chapter 2 after Paul goes through it and lays out these amazing blessings and benefits that we have because we are the children of God. He then get, starts in chapter 2 to get into to unfolding uh, more detail of what this means in the way of how we should be living, how we should be conducting ourselves. <clears throat> so, start off looking first of all at the gloomy passage in verses 1 through 3. Paul here in these verses described the gloomy path of sin and control by the prince of the power of air, Satan, from which God had deliver, delivered these saints. Remember, he is speaking to the saints in the church at Ephesus. So he's relating to them uh, those things that have come about because of this great work that God has done in them. Let's, let's read these verses and, and analyze them a little closer. Verses 1 through 3. He said, And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sin, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all was conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. So look, first of all, the contrast in verse, verse 1. Notice it started off by saying, and you he made alive. Uh, by the way, he made alive is in italics in the Bible. Basically, it's indicating that in the region, original Greek, that wasn't there, however, what it is, it reflects the Im implied, uh, it, it implies what's being stated. And it's put in there to, to give a little, a little additional clarity to what's been said. So he's, he's saying that these believers in Ephesus have been made alive. And in the King James Version, it says quickened. That is, they were initially dead. We come into this world dead or unconnected uh, to God. And he's saying because of what Christ has done and because of their response to what Christ has done, now they have been quickened or they have been made alive. Now they have a connection with God. But then he goes on to describe the, the life that they were living before so that they can get some sense of how wonderful this quickening is, this, this new life that they've been given. He said, you were dead in trespasses and sins. Trespasses speak in terms of doing things wrong, being off course. And, and sin speaks in terms of missing the mark. So he's basically indicating that before they were quickened, before they had this encounter with the Lord that led them to accept the Lord Jesus Christ, they were dead. That is, that they were insensitive to, unaware of, un unconnected to God and spirituality and all those things that, that he had described over in chapter 1. 
that they benefited from at this particular time. So they were in a bad state before this encounter with an acceptance of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he goes on to say, in which you once, uh, uh, then, then, and let's look at the condition. He said, in, in which you once walked according to the course of this world. In other words, they lived a lifestyle that was consistent with the influences of the world. They did worldly things. They thought worldly things. They spoke worldly things. So they were completely anti-spirituality and anti those things that God desires for us to be aware of. Then he goes on and said, said uh, according to the prince of the power of the air. So first of all, they had this worldly influence. And then there is this person, Satan, that controls, that, that influences, that tries to keep people from focusing on. In fact, over in our Second Corinthians, uh, it re references the fact that, in effect, well, Satan put blinders on. The world and Satan puts us in a position where those who may want something even different, if you don't have an encounter with Christ, you are blinded to the vastness of the beauty of knowing him and those things that he desires for us. So Satan is the one who kind of oversees uh, worldliness, the things that are going on. So the, one, the, we have this big enemy of the world. Then we have Satan who's doing all he can to impress upon those who are around that world is where their attention should be. And then, of course, we have this flesh, this natural inclination to be tied into and be attracted to those things that the world offers and that the state, Satan puts in our face to interfere with life and put us in a position where we are not focused on anything except self. How can, how can I please myself? How can I take care of the, my needs? And in reality, life is much more than that. And, in, and then on top of that, God is the one who provides the grace necessary so we can live. And he, his grace uh, allows us to be able to partake of food for our bodies. His grace. Remember, the rain comes on the godly and the ungodly. His grace provides us strength to continue on in this life, just his, his general, his common grace. But then we will focus on that other, uh, what we refer to as efficacious grace, effective grace that pulls us into a relationship with him. But the world and Satan wants us to just tap into those things that we can see and not look beyond those and just be overwhelmed, just overcome with, with things that we find attractive to flush or drawn to. So he tells us in the past, he he's telling these Ephesian believers that in the past, that first of all, they've been quickened. However, they had been in, uh, they had been dead to trespass and sin. And the way that that is particularly shown is what he said, in which you walk because they've been uh, dead in trespasses and sin. They walk according to what the world dictated and what the world provided. And part, one of the key elements driving that was the prince of the power of air, Satan over. In, in fact, over in chapter 6, it tells us that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, uh, but against principalities, against powers, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So it's a reminder of how Satanic, satanic forces are constantly moving to interfere and disrupt our lives. And those who are in, in the world, they are attra attracted and tied up in that. Whereas those who have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ are being drawn away from that, which we'll, we'll get into 
uh, a little more in a moment. And then he goes on and said, the spirit which now works in the sons of disobedience. So this, this spirit, this, this, this sense of worldliness that's dr driving uh, those who don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, those who are being attracted to Satan, it drives them to focus on those things that are inconsistent with God. In effect, disobedient to God's will, God's intent, and God's purpose. So he, it, 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 it's, it's something that, that's really consuming. If, you, if we allow ourselves in this state to just be swallowed up and surrounded by worldliness and caught up in it, we, in effect, manifest this kind of spirit. We delight in worldly things. And... That's what, what he, that's what Paul is letting these believers at Ephesians know. At one time, they were just like someone out in the world who was not aware of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he goes on to say, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as others. Notice he says, among whom also we all. So Paul acknowledges that at one time he was in a worldly state. And because of it, the actions were reflective of those things that appease our flesh. Notice he said, conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh. So you, that there was a focus on doing those things that felt good to the flesh, that drew, drew a person completely away from godliness, uh, any sort of righteousness, but the, the focus on is what can I do to satisfy uh, the flesh? And in reality, the flesh has an, an appetite that you really can't satisfy. You if, if, if we allow ourselves to chase after uh, fleshly things, we're constantly chasing, trying to fulfill uh, this, this uh, uneasiness that we have in our lives. And the bottom line on it is that there is a void that we have that in reality only God can fill that void. But we constantly run around in circles if we have not encountered the Lord Jesus Christ and yielded to him. We constantly run around in, in circles trying to appease ourselves, trying to appease the flesh, when in the re reality, as we said, the flesh cannot be fully appeased, cannot be fully satisfied. And notice he said, it, he emphasizes this fact by saying, fulfilling desires of the flesh and the mind. So there's this constant... Uh, attempt to do what we can to satisfy the flesh, to please the flesh. But in reality, that what wouldn't happen. We, in effect, just run around in circles, uh, getting nowhere and trying to appease the flesh. And the end result of this, I said, we're by nature children of wrath. God we are accountable to God. God is the one who has created us. And accordingly, there's an expectation that we will show appreciation to him. And if we don't, we will have to pay. Those who don't accept the Lord Jesus Christ will have to pay the ultimate debt and that you will be separated from him eternally and his wrath would be unfolded on you and I don't, don't want to get into the any graphics of what will will happen but we know that you end up in a burning hell if you don't accept the Lord Jesus Christ and he and then he concludes by saying just as others in other words that this 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 is a, a common thing if you don't know God you're basically a, a Child, it's just that children of wrath. And you're part of the children of wrath. So he's making it very clear that 
and, and just don't forget what we just went over in chapter one about just how amazing the blessings are that flow into a, one who accepts the Lord Jesus Christ. And now what Paul is getting them to see is that blessing is so far removed and so much better than what they had they had lived in in the past. So he's basically encouraging them to look on how God has blessed them and appreciate the unique blessings that they have. Remember this chapter one in effect concluded with indicating this resurrection power of the Lord Jesus Christ would be a part of them and that Christ eventually would be one who would be in control of everything. And so now what, what he's letting them see is that what they were involved in before, the life that they had before they met the Lord Jesus Christ, is empty and worthless. And you get a chance to see the huge contrast between the beauty of knowing the Lord Jesus Christ and the ugliness of being caught out in the world, separated from him. So that... that, that concludes the first section, looking at the, the gloomy past, past. Now let's look at the great provision uh, in verses 4 through 7. First of all, Paul, Paul wanted the saints to know that the Lord's great deliverance set them in heavenly places to receive his boundless grace in ages to come. A number of years back, I, uh, it's been quite a few years back, the, these verses just just grip me, uh, just just to think in terms of what we were we as unbelievers had been tied up in, and how worthless and useless that life was. And then all of a sudden, Paul opens up and it explains this this amazing life that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he has gone in these first three verses and explained, told them initially that they've been saved and then uh, let them look at how their lives had been empty and void and, and worthless before. And now he gets down to verse, verse four and begins to focus just on this great relationship that we have with the Lord and all the, the many, many benefits that accrue from it. And he, remember, he had started off relating to those, uh, relating those over in, the, in, the, in chapter one. But starting with verse four, he said, but God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love, which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Let's look at, first of all the commitment in verses 4 and 5. S see that you know, it says that God was just rich in grace and mercy. And he had this tremendous love for mankind. Remember over in John 3, 16? For God so loved, so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. So God, it's as though God looked out at the ugliness of what mankind had created in turning his back on, on God in the Garden of Eden and said, I love them. And I will bring them back to me. And it shows that he says he's rich in mercy. God should have just destroyed man for what we had done in turning our back on him. But he said he was rich in mercy. God did not want to get rid of us. And then, it, more so, it was just 
more and more and more with the richness of his mercy. And then this, this love that he had for mankind. Remember, man was the, the capstone or the, cry, the crown, if you will, of God's creation. God went through and created everything. And on that sixth day, he grabbed the dust of the earth, formed man, and then breathed into him. God, in effect, godliness, breathed into him the breath of life. And God, you, you, you just see all through the Bible, God did not want his great creation just to move away from him and be totally disconnected to him, from him forever. God has this eternal plan that's being unfolded so we can be brought back to him and it starts with this uh, almost boundless mercy and this boundless love that he has for mankind. And then in spite of being in a position where we are opposite him, where we are in effect enemies of his, those who would, would have been children of wrath, he said even while we were uh, dead in while they were dead past in trespassing and sin, he made them alive in Christ. In other words, because of what Christ Jesus did and the presence of and his Holy Spirit touching them and them being responsive to Christ's great work, they were brought back into him. And then, it, then in, in parentheses it says, by grace you have been saved, alluding to something we will get into a little more further down in this lesson, but it's the grace of God. God's unmerited favor, uh, the acronym has been said to be uh, uh, God's riches at Christ's expense. So the riches, the boundlessness, the limitlessness of God's love and mercy is, is unfolded on us because of the work of Christ and the acceptance of that work. And then he said, not only did, did uh, God, in effect, grab us, make us alive, save us, but then he raised us up together. That is referencing back to this resurrection power that the Lord Jesus Christ displayed when he got up from the grave is now available to us to, because we had been dead and now he has raised us from that deadness into life and then made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So, so positionally, now we are in effect in the heavenly realm with Christ Jesus. You remember toward the end of chapter one where he was speaking of him being in charge of everything, everything would be under his feet. Remember over Philippians, he said, said that every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord. So we're getting a chance to see here that we are in connection, in communion with God, with, with Christ in, uh, in heavenly places. And then verse 7. This, 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 this verse just... has you know, almost like overwhelming implications. Notice it says that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Which says, when you reflect on the wonderful things that have been said about the benefits and the blessings that those who believed in Christ received in chapter 1. And then to think here, what it's telling us that God's grace, in effect, has been untapped relative to what will be received in the ages to come. So we will go from, in effect, grace to grace. We benefit now from how much God has given us, how much God loved us, how much his rich mercy has been made available to us 
And then we will continue to go that in the ages to come, so not only in the future, but um, in the present, but in the future, God will just unfold his riches. Just, just for a moment, I want, want to, uh, uh, this, this particular book is focused on the church, the body of Christ. Over in chapter 3, an amazing statement is made about what God's intent is for the church. In verse 10, it says, To the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God may be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in heavenly places. So God is taking this church that is being called out, that he's really speaking of here. He's speaking to of the believers, speaking to the believers in Ephesus who have become a part of this body of Christ. And he's letting them know the unique blessings and benefits that they have because of what Christ Jesus has done. And they have accepted that. But then God has a purpose and a reason. We'll, we'll speak of it in a moment. And over in, in chapter 3, it's letting us know that the church is uh, a beautiful centerpiece that gives the principalities and powers an opportunity to observe God's amazing wisdom. Just think, the angelic hosts have been observing God for eons, and now all of a sudden they're getting the chance to see that they have li very little awareness, really, of the wisdom of God. And that God's wisdom continues to be unfolded in how he calls and develops and uses the church to, sh to glorify him. And so, telling us that in the ages to come, those who have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ will be partakers, notice it said, of the exceeding riches of his grace. And then this, this kindness, we, we, this loving, remember God, kindness is one of those, <clears throat> it, it mentioned when we think in terms of fruit of the spirit. This God's loving kindness is poured out, just showered, just overflowing in the ages to come because of Christ Jesus and the great work that he's done. So we, we see that here uh, we, we have an opportunity to recognize how blessed and how hopeful we can be in present as well as in the future. You know, we are saved, as I said, we are, we are saved when we accept the Lord Jesus Christ. We are being saved as we grow in, in his grace and knowledge, and we will be saved completely when we are in his presence. It's uh, the, the sanctify, we are, we are being set apart we have been set apart positionally. We will be, we are being set apart more and more as we know him, and we will be set apart completely when we're with him. And we will just be partakers of his amazing grace. Uh, it, it is when, when we stop for a moment to reflect on the experiences we have here on earth. The wonderful creation God has allowed us to live in and be a part of. It, it sometimes cloudies our, well, not something, it cloudies our view and perspective of what it would be like being in God's presence without sin, without anything being between us and God and him just unfolding all of his divine beauty and splendor. And that's one of the things that Paul is trying to get uh, these to 
reflect on is that not only are we, are, were they blessed at this particular time because they knew God, but blessings would improve and get better and better over time. In fact, Paul says over, over in 1 Corinthians, eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, neither has it entered the heart of man. Those things that are prepared for them who love God. And that's speaking in terms of our experience here on earth. And then Paul projects out into the beyond that in the ages to come, God's grace is inexhaustible. Just think now, we're able to wake up each day and partake of new mercies, new grace. We don't have to reach back and worry about trying to grab what happened yesterday or last week or last year. But then, as much as God continues to unfold his amazing grace in our lives daily, weekly, monthly, and yearly as time goes on, still does not tap into the vastness of his grace. And we will be full partakers of it as we are brought in to intimacy with him uh, in, in the future. Now, let's look at our last segment here. <laughs> Glorious position uh, in verses 8 to 10. See, only God's grace saves saints through faith without any personal merit. And he had a specific eternal plan for each to do good works. First of all, let's look at the instrument. First of all, let's, let's just review the verses. Note again, it says, for by grace are you saved or through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So let's, let's, let's look at the, the instrument in verses uh, 8 and 9. As we just said, it says, for by grace are you saved. So salvation, deliverance is all of God. It is his grace that allows us to be pulled out of this darkness that we're in the midst of in this world and then step into the marvelous light so we can see the realities of what life is. He said, and then the vehicle or the instrument by which we are able to tap into, or should I say God unleashes his grace, is through faith. Our faith in what God does and who God is is what, uh, what is the instrument that triggers his faith, I mean, excuse me, triggers his grace so that it's showered down on us. You know, we're told faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Our hope is to have a relationship with God. Our hope is to have a heavenly home and be able to partake of life as life is intended. And that faith unleashes the grace of God. By the way, that faith is something that we are given. You know, we, we, we have this, God uh, equips us with the faith to trigger accepting and responding to him and in turn, his grace then saves us. For by grace, you are saved through faith. And notice he said, he said, that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. It's a, speaking of his faith, it's a gift of God. You know, that, that, that we are able to tap into the grace that God gives us. And then notice he said, not of works. There's nothing we can do on our own to earn salvation. Salvation is a complete, total work of God. The fir first of all, we have to take on into consideration who we are. 
as humans uh, who don't know God as unregenerate, we are totally depraved. We are self-centered. We are self-focused. In fact, uh, Jeremiah indicates to us that we, we, we're hopeless. That our sin is just, just, we are completely wrapped up in sin. And because of that, we are completely tied into the world and what the world offers. And God provides a totally different opportunity, a totally different life. In fact, he gives real life, what life is truly about. Remember, Christ says he, come, he didn't come that we might just have life, but life more abundantly. So accordingly, God has saved us through his grace. But that grace has been triggered by our faith in accepting what he has, he has said. And then, again, it's not anything that we do. It's just a blessing we're in a position to be receivers of God's grace. And then the, the other thing, notice he said, lest anyone should boast. One of the things that, that th implicit in this is God does not like pride. Um, just imagine, what, whatever peace we think we could claim about God. We'd walk around saying, well, God saved me because I'm this or I'm that. But God saved us purely because he loved us and has provided an instrument, a way in which our sinfulness can be wiped away. And we simply have to accept that so that his work in and through us can continue really can start and then continue so that he can be glorified and we can partake of the full wonderful benefits of being in him of knowing him and then look at the intention here in verse 10 he said we for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Notice it says for this is, this is sort of indicative of like a, a culmination of sort of thing kind of like building to a crescendo. He's gone and explained to them uh, that they've been saved from this gloomy past. And then he relates to them uh, some, some, of the, some of the great thing, the great position that they're in with God. And now he's going into uh, this, this uh, glorious position uh, that they're in. So what, what, he, what he's telling them is that you are his workmanship. That word in the Greek, workmanship, it uh, speaks in terms of like poetry, uh, or some, so, so it, or, or great artwork or something. So it, it's indicating sort of the beauty of what God has created uh, when he has allowed those who believe to come into his family and be put into the body of Christ. He has created a beautiful something that is observable in the world. And, you know, we just read over in chapter 3 how God working in and through the church was positioning the church so that the universe, those who have been around a while, the angelic host and principalities and powers are able to observe the incomparable wisdom of God. So he said, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for a reason. The reason is so that good works can be done through each and every one of those who've accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, the saints, God has created this body so that the saints can be used for good works, good works indicating 
a reflection of his righteousness and how things should be done, how we should live, how we should conduct ourselves. And then, notice he said, and God prepared beforehand that they should walk in them. In other words, God has already laid out this eternal plan. God has this eternal plan. Let us never lose sight of the fact that God has this eternal plan that will be followed. And it's critical that as believers accept what God has for them, as believers understand more and more who he is and the beauty of the Lord Jesus Christ, as believers then are able to see how that should be reflected in how they live and conduct their, themselves, the thoughts, the words, the actions will be consistent with those things that are good works that glorify God. In fact, we are told all that we do, whether in word or in deed, it should all be done to the glory of God. So here we have seen what God has talked about, this, this unique relationship that he's developed uh, with those who have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, how he's empowered them. And now he closes out by letting us know that it's purposeful. It's all a part of God's plan that you should live and conduct themselves in such a way that God is glorified. So, let's see if we can wrap this up. You know, as you know, when you walk into a dark room, you're not able to see what is around you. Thus, there tends to be disorientation and uncertainty about where you are and whether there is anything or anyone in the room. However, when the light switch is turned on, you begin to get your bearings and recognize the things around you. Eventually, you can see clearly and do whatever you need to do. Similarly, accepting the perfect work of the Lord Jesus Christ, believing and believing in him imparts spiritual life and the wonderful blessings that come with being in communion with him. Our lesson today should remind us we were once spiritually dead and worthy of God's wrath. However, his boundless grace is showered on us once we believe in Christ and go from death and darkness to being in him, with him in heavenly places. We are special to God. God has created and called us specially so that he can be glorified. And when we take under consideration how he has showered us with his amazing grace, we should be so willing to understand what he wants to do with us so we walk in alignment with his perfect will and his plan can be manifested and he truly can be glorified everywhere and in everything. God bless you and God keep you. And good Lord says the same. We will see you next week.